Well, I think we'll get started. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sheila Clausen Weeb, and I teach biblical studies at Canadian Mennonite University. I want to extend a really warm welcome to all of you in this virtual community. Welcome to faculty and staff and students who are part of this on campus learning community uh, here at CMU. And a very special welcome to those of you who are joining us from elsewhere in Winnipeg and from across the country, maybe even outside the country, who knows? This pandemic has challenged us all in so many ways, but one of the few positive things to come out of it is this possibility of gathering for lectures and conferences, even when we're physically distant from each other. So you are all warmly welcome here. Even though we do not all have our feet planted on the same plot of land today, I want to acknowledge that the land on which we do stand is not ours, but belongs to Creator God, who has entrusted its care to us. I also wish to acknowledge the people who lived on this land before we did, and with whom we continue to share it, the Anishinaabe, Cree, Dakota, and Métis people of Treaty 1 territory. We're grateful for the stewardship of this. Their, we're grateful for their stewardship of this land and water, and their hospitality, which allows us to live and work and serve the Creator here. Simi is grateful for a growing circle of friendship among Indigenous peoples and for shared commitments to build understanding and reconciliation. A brief word about this lecture series. If you are from Winnipeg, you may have been attending the JG Tucson lectures lectures every year for decades. And normally you would be making your way to the chapel on campus right now and drinking coffee in the foyer and chatting with friends. Um, that's, we're not doing it that way this year. If you're from far away, you may have never heard of these lectures before. So I'm gonna say a few things about the lectures for those of you who, uh, who are new to this tradition. The J.J. Tyson lectures are a long-standing tradition on our campus. They were established in 1978 by Canadian Mennonite Bible College, one of the founding colleges uh, of CMU. And they are named after Reverend J.J. Tyson, a founder of the college and a longtime chair of the board. This, uh, it's a lecture series in biblical and theological studies, and it seem, seeks to bring to this university community something of Reverend Thiessen's breadth of vision for the church and Christian education. So the overall title of the lectures this year is Mediation and the Immediate God, part of a book by the same name, which will be published in the coming year. We're delighted to have Dr. Edith Humphrey from Pittsburgh Theological Seminary with us virtually to deliver the lecture series this year. A warm welcome to you, Dr. Humphrey. I will be introducing her more fully in a few minutes. Before we do that though, we wanna participate in another long-standing CMU tradition, which is to situate these lectures in the context of worship. By doing this, we're acknowledging that all our work is done in service to God and that our scholarly activity is not separate from our worship. So we won't attempt to, to sing a hymn on Zoom, but now we all know how well that works. But we will listen to a passage of scripture and I will open with a prayer. So the scripture text that Edith has chosen for us for this first lecture is 1 Timothy 2 verses one to seven. I'll be reading it from the New Revised Standard Version. First of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and is acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus, himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. This was attested at the right time. For this I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles, 
in faith and truth. The word of the Lord. Please bow with me for prayer. God, our Savior, all that we have and all that we are, we owe to you. And so we give you thanks. We thank you for the blessing of communities of faith and learning, for books, for rich and stimulating conversations, and for teachers and mentors who have led us to where we are now. We thank you especially today for Dr. Edith Humphrey and for the gifts that she offers us this evening. We ask your blessing on her as she shares the fruits of her labor with us and with you. God, you have blessed us all with minds to know you, hearts to love you, and hands to serve you. Open our minds, our hearts, and our wills now so that we may more faithfully live as followers of Jesus. May our study, our service, and our worship give glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to introduce Dr. Humphrey here now a little bit before she speaks to us. Dr. Edith Humphrey is the William F. Orr Professor Emerita of New Testament at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. She earned her doctorate from McGill University, Montreal, yes, Canada, for which she received the Governor General's Gold Medal. Before taking the position in Pittsburgh, she taught at several colleges and universities in Canada, including Augustine College in Ottawa, where she also served as dean for a year. Dr. Humphrey is the author of numerous articles and nine books on topics as diverse as apocalypses, worship, Christian spirituality, human sexuality, and C.S. Lewis. She's currently working on a book about reading Paul's doctrine of justification through the eyes of the church fathers. Her most recent book is called Beyond the White Fence. It's a novel for middle school children in which six young people travel in time and space to meet the saints for which they are named. It sounds delightful to me and I can hardly wait to read it. Dr. Humphrey is not only an outstanding scholar, but also an accomplished musician. She served as music director for St. George Anglican Church when she was in Ottawa and plays oboe in the North Pittsburgh Symphonic Band. Edith's earliest Christian formation was in the Salvation Army, and she was a Salvation Army officer in Ontario and Quebec with her husband for five years. She then was active in the Anglican Communion for 25 years and has part, been part of the Orthodox Church for the past 12. Married to her husband, Chris, for 46 years, she is a mother of three daughters and sons-in-law and grandmother to 20 grandchildren. Since her retirement in January 2021, she has continued to teach in various milieu, write and speak frequently in Christian and academic contexts. We're delighted to have you with us, Dr. Humphrey, and we look forward to hearing you speak to us about mediation, the immediate God, and our great mediator. A note to all of you listening that there will be a time for questions after the lecture. So be pre prepared for that and save up your questions. Turn now to the lecture, Dr. Humphrey. Thank you so much, Professor Klaas and Liebe. It's um, wonderful to be um, at least virtually with fellow Canadians. Of course, I'm American now, but one never leaves one's past behind. And I was telling um, those who are here to facilitate the lecture that I actually spent a summer or close to a whole summer in Winnipeg when my husband and I were training for ministry at the Salvation Army. It was our, our training appointment this summer between uh, our two uh, training college years. And I remember being there with, uh, 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 with, um, with great um, pleasure, actually. I'm going to now see if I can do things properly and share my screen. I think we have a go. Are you seeing it all right, everyone? So the topic for the next few days, the general topic is mediation and the immediate God. And tonight we're going to consider mediation, the immediate God and our great mediator. 
But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his or her neighbor and his or her brother and sister, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. This luminous promise of the Lord reiterated in Hebrews chapter 8 verses 10 and 11. This promise anticipates the new covenant longed for by God's ancient people and brought to us by the Lord Jesus. Unlike those who lived under the old covenant, where the operation of the Spirit's power was normally restricted to consecrated priests, inspired prophets, and anointed kings, Christians are not foundationally dependent upon other special Christians to have communion with God. And so long before the new covenant was put in place, the great Moses rightly yearned, would that the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. As the prophet Jeremiah affirms, those in the new covenant depend personally upon the Lord, for they shall know me from the least of them to the greatest. And so it is. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and chapter 4, that St. Paul speaks about the removal of the veil from the eyes of God's people. That, that veil that had hidden the general Hebrew community, hidden from them the secret to which the Torah and Moses were pointing. Now, the Apostle Paul proclaims we can all with unveiled faces look upon and reflect the glory of the Lord. The creating God, he proclaims, has brought about a new situation in which we all and each have seen the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So if this is true, why does mediation continue to be a natural part of our lives together in the church? If the coming of the God-man Jesus and the sending of the Holy Spirit to the church has made God immediate to us, so that each of us can speak directly with him, then why do we still pray for one another? Why do we still honor and defer to those who know him well? And why do those who are in the Roman Catholic and Orthodox communities pray with and to them? Why does the ancient church revere in icons and relics and songs and petitions those whom she calls saints? Should believers expect those faithful who have passed from this world to pray for them? Should they continue to pray for other beloved who have passed into eternity? Is such mediation passe, a thing of the old covenant, or does it have a natural and continuing place among all of God's redeemed people, both those whom we see and those who are asleep in the Lord? And if it has a continuing important role, why is that so? We know that these questions cause sharp disagreement among those who name Jesus. Probably some have already frowned tonight. Among those of us who, all of us who look to Jesus as our great mediator. Indeed, such questions are intertwined with quarrels among Christians that seem nearly intractable. My hope is that our study this evening and tomorrow will help us to clarify some of these questions that we pose to one another on these matters and help us to better understand each other so that a real conversation can take place. I hope that in doing so, we will also lift up the one perfect mediator, the God-man Jesus, while honoring those who are now in his direct presence and who see him face to face. My husband, who is a philosopher by discipline, reminds me that the matter of mediation and immediacy is also a philosophical problem. Nothing that we know is, strictly speaking, immediate, for we know by means of data interpreted through our bodies and our minds. Furthermore, since the time of Kant, those who co contemplate how humans think, 
that's the discipline of epistemology, they have become more skeptical regarding our ability to actually know anything in itself. I can know my perception of a thing, many warn us, but I cannot know if I really know the thing. From the philosophical perspective, then, the title of my forthcoming book and these lectures may be ill-advised. If even the mundane things that we know require mediation, and we cannot be certain that we actually know these, then there surely can be no immediate experience of God who is obviously far harder to understand than his creation. But of course, we use the word immediate in less absolute ways, don't we? Let's leave aside for the purposes of this discussion then the Kantian problem of knowledge, which if taken rigorously would lead us to frozen inactivity and an absurd agnosticism of everything, including the paradoxical inability to know that we do not know. For those of us who have concern over such matters, it may be helpful to adopt the perspective known as critical realism. This approach is critical because it acknowledges the problem of direct knowledge for embodied and limited persons. And yet it is realistic in that it also admits that if we are to talk about anything, human beings must assume that things around them exist, really do exist, and that we can have at least an approximate knowledge of them. From this common sense perspective, I can speak of knowledge that I have that is personally immediate to me. That is, I know the thing or I know the person because of my own connection to the object that is known and not simply on the authority of someone else. This kind of knowledge is true in general living and also it appears in the spiritual realm. Consider the case of the Samaritans who, witness, who were witnessed to by the woman who met Jesus at the well, traditionally named, named Fotini or Fotina, the illumined one among ancient Christians. Yes, they heard about Jesus, the Messiah, by means of her words. But then they had invited him to stay with them, and they heard his teaching for two whole days. After this, they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard him ourselves, and we know that this is truly the savior of the world. His dwelling with them transformed a mediated word into an immediate encounter. And so they believed for themselves. And there were now several hundred Fotinis or illumined ones and not simply one. This is possible because the Almighty Lord has the wherewithal and the desire to take upon himself to assume everything that it is to be human. And he has done so and so to dwell with and among us. What happened to that Samaritan community is true also of us personally. As St. Paul declares, the word is near you on your lips and in your heart. As the reason Jesus promises in the book of Revelation, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him or her and eat with that one and that one with me. God engages then to work personally with us, face to face and heart to heart, and does this both as the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Son, as he names each of us his brother or sister, and we can see that in Hebrews 2. And he also does this as the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, comes to dwell within each one of us and in the church as a whole. Yet, the corporate nature of Christ's body, the church, is also an integral part of the good news. We frequently miss this emphasis when we read contemporary English translations of the Bible, which cannot distinguish in the absence of the archaic thou, thee, thine, between the singular you and the plural you. As a result, Many of the assurances and the promises given by God to his people as a whole are mistakenly assumed by the contemporary reader, primarily to address the individual. There are rather far more passages in the scriptures that speak about God's presence with his body among us than with individuals. Orthodox believers remind each other of this weekly with our liturgical uh, salutation and response and perhaps your 
community has a similar one. We say Christ is among us, and then someone responds, he is and ever shall be. Moreover, even those passages that suggest an individual relationship with God involve other believers. Consider again the passages concerning the Samaritans and the knocking Jesus. The Samaritans came to have a personal connection with the Lord, but it was first mediated to them by the woman. Jesus promises the lukewarm Laodiceans that each of them may have a deep and passionate relationship with him if he or she opens the door. But this promise is transmitted to us today by means of several layers of mediation. Jesus, with the approval of the Father, has appeared in a vision to John, Revelation 1.1. He has addressed himself to the angel of each church, Revelation 2.1. The contents of his messages to the seven churches have been written down at Christ's command, Revelation 1.19. They've been gathered together with other visions in the apocalypse, Revelation chapter 22. And that book has finally been read and validated as Holy Scripture by diverse communities of the Holy Church, West and East. And we read it in our own languages by means of translators. As the first verse of the Apocalypse, which actually is a lengthy title, puts it, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, and he made, known it, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. The process involved Jesus, angels, visions, words, John the Visionary, Scrolls, and Codices, and the work of our older siblings in the faith. It seems then that mediation is the norm, even when we see examples or teaching concerning immediate relationship with God. In all this, we may perceive a tension or a paradox surrounding the question of how we know God and how we know about God. God can and does come to each of us personally. But God normatively has used and continues even under the new covenant to use others as he reveals himself to us. Of course, mediation is a large category and it includes actions of teaching, reconciling and interpreting as well as of prayer. In these sessions, we're mostly gonna concentrate upon the final aspect, prayer for one another while acknowledging the broader aspect of mediation. We'll begin this evening with the one mediator between God and humanity, the God-man, the God-human, our Lord Jesus Christ. We're well, then going to go on in this first session tomorrow to consider our mediation for each other and for those outside the church. And then finally, in session three, we will look at how the matriarchs in Matthew's gospel provide a model for mediation and also move on to the debated talk, topic of mediation of the saints. So you have to come tomorrow night. In the end, we're going to see how mediation is an essential mark of the church. Christians are meant to be mediators because we bear the image of Christ, the mediator. So then, let's begin with him, our great mediator. I remember how, as an older child and teen who was nurtured in the Salvation Army, I sang with gusto, a chorus that I think is particular to the Salvation Army, and maybe we even sang it in East Kildonan Corps in the suburbs of Winnipeg when I was here many years ago. It goes like this. For there is one God and one mediator, twixt God and man. For there is one God and one mediator, the man, Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for us all, who gave himself a ransom for us all, who gave himself a ransom for us all. Oh, what a wonderful Savior, for there is one God and one mediator, twixt God and man. For there is one God and one mediator, the man, Christ Jesus. Well, this chorus is, of course, a versification of the text in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. And its focus is, as it should be, on the glory of the God-man, our Savior. 
But I'm fairly sure that as we sang it, some of the more informed Salvationists also understood it to be a kind of cry of protest against other forms of Christianity that looked to saints for mediating help. Only this connection accounts for the militant rhythm in which the chorus was sung and the atmosphere that it evoked, akin to a kind of team pep rally. We took seriously the scriptures and did not let any superstition or ossifying accretions weigh down our understanding of the uniqueness of Christ. As with the army's rejection of baptism, we thought that nothing was necessary for the Christian except bare naked faith. Indeed, these verses from 1 Timothy are understood not only by my, by my childhood community, but by numerous other Protestant assemblies as a clear scriptural rejection of any mediators besides the Lord Jesus himself. For this reason, then, before we can go on to explore the positive teaching concerning Jesus and mediation in Hebrews and the fourth gospel, we have to carefully address this statement concerning Jesus as the only mediator. The great mediation. Certainly these verses in 1 Timothy pose a challenge for those of us who delight in the mediation of saints. How do we answer our friends when they question us? First, most Christians agree that we ought not to pick and choose among passages in scripture. Rather, the whole of scriptures must inform our views, our, our structures, our actions. Concerning the declaration of one mediator, we encounter a puzzle when we go to the Bible as a whole. If that were to be taken as an absolute, the statement is contradicted elsewhere. For example, in the book of Revelation, the 24 elders present the prayers of the saints in bowls of incense before God's throne, even though the great mediator, the Lamb, is there in the center of things. Scripture cannot contradict Scripture. So, what do these verses in 1 Timothy mean then? It may help if we look to these verses for their positive and transformational significance, not simply as a rally cry to be used against those who revere the saints of the past. What did the apostle mean when he spoke of Jesus as the one mediator? So let's read 1 Timothy 2 in context uh, with the help of some of the ancient theologians of the church. The first thing to notice is that the main topic of mediation, the main topic here is mediation in general, as practiced by the Christian community. Verse 1, first of all, then I urge that entreaties, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. I notice you've got a little bit different version. I hope that doesn't put you off on the screen. So then, Jesus' status as the only mediator comes to us within a passage that envisages us all as intercessors, all as mediators, when we bring prayers to God on behalf of others. Why not simply let folks pray for themselves, since God-man is the only mediator who truly loves them and has the power to act for their well-being? Yet, we are called, because we are Christians, to pray here. And that's a form of standing between God and the one for whom we are praying. But if mediation is truly the task of God's body, why does the apostle characterize Jesus as unique? We notice in the flow of the letter's argument that the call to intercede on behalf of all, including non-Christian leaders, is explained both in pragmatic terms, it will afford peace to the community, verse 2, and in theological terms, verses 3 and 4, God loves all and wills their salvation. As we reflect on God's will in this matter, however, we become aware of a problem. It is not certain that all shall be saved despite God's will. So then, the passage goes on immediately to speak about the grounds of our redemption, Jesus, the one mediator between God and humanity, verse 5 who gave himself as a ransom, verse 6. The passage thus joins together God's will with God's action. The one true God wills for all to be saved, and so the one mediator became our ransom. Oneness, of course, is the most basic characteristic of the one true God. As the Hebrew people reminded themselves daily, 
with Deuteronomy 6, 4, Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Christians cleave to the same teaching, as Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, where he says, an idol has no real existence, and there is no God but one, now known, he will go on to explain, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In this vein, the Blessed Augustine reads 1 Timothy's words regarding Jesus as the one mediator, as a warning for those who wrongly suppose that the accomplishment of God's will might come through good human living alone, without partaking of the body and blood of Christ. And so we hear that Jesus is the mediator of our redemption. Further prayers are to be offered in his name for others, no matter what their position in society, in hope that they will respond to God's love. It's because of Jesus' ransom that St. Paul enjoins our prayers for others in verses 1 through 3. But prayers are not magic. Cooperation with God, Augustine insists, is indicated at every level when we intercede for others and when they respond to God. But the initiative for our redemption is from God alone. This leads us to make another observation. The mediator of our redemption is a human among humans, the human Christ Jesus. It is apt that the perfect one who dwelt among us should offer sacrifice and ongoing intercession for his own brothers and sisters, as we learn in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. And yet... Like the Father, he is one, that is, he is unique, and he is divine. St. Ambrose does a careful exposition of 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. This text, he says, indeed refers properly to his incarnation, for our redemption was made by his blood. Our pardon comes through his power. Our life is secured through his grace. He gives us, he gives, sorry, he gives as the Most High. He prays as man. The one is the office of the creator, the other of a redeemer. Be the gifts as distinct as they may, yet the giver is one, for it was fitting that our maker should be our redeemer. Similarly, St. Gregory of Nazianzus exclaims, Oh, how beautiful and mystical and kind, for he still pleads even now as man for my salvation. He continues to wear the body which he assumed until he makes me divine by the power of his incarnation, although he is no longer known after the flesh, the same as ours, except for sin. And the commentator, Theodore of Mopsuestia, reflects the consensus of all the fathers when he says that this passage in 1 Timothy refers to the perfect humanity by which salvation is wrought. And then he goes on to speak of Jesus' shared humanity with us as the whole key to salvation. Besides stressing his humanity, the fathers use our passage to confirm the, confirm the divinity of Christ. And so St. John Chrysostom teaches us to read carefully and to notice that the oneness of God in this passage is not intended to mark God off from the mediator who is also God, but from idols. Indeed, it is the humanity alongside the retained divine nature that the blessed Augustine insists is necessary. A quotation from him a little longer than what you have on the screen. The divine son of God put on humanity without putting off his divinity and built this firm path of faith so that man, by means of the God-man, could find his way to man's God. For it is as man that he is the mediator, and as man that he is the way. In reflecting on this paradox, St. Gregory of Nyssa takes his cue from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And he calls this effort for the human household the mystery of godliness. He says this, by the word mediator, he reveals to us the whole aim of the mystery of godliness. Now the aim is this. Humanity once revolted through the malice of the enemy and brought into bondage to sin was also alienated from the true life. After this, the Lord of the creature calls back to him his own creature and becomes man while still remaining God. 
being both God and man in the entirety of the two separate natures. Thus, humanity was indissolubly united to God, the man that is in Christ conducting the work of mediation, to whom by the first fruits assumed for us all the lump, the whole of humanity, is potentially united. Notice how the saint speaks of the human ailments of both sin and death and goes on to speak of how we are potentially united to the mediator who is him, who in himself joined God with humanity in his two natures and not just as one who accomplished the work of mediation. Uh, St. Gregory leads us to understand we, we can speak of Jesus as the true mediator, not just the means of God's mediation, because it's in his very self that he joins together the natures of God and humanity. We might even say he is the mediation. He is the way, as he named himself. Indeed, the incarnation is, in its essence, a mediation, a tryst or a meeting place where God and humanity are joined. And if you're interested in more on that, I recommend uh, my book, um, Ecstasy and Intimacy, where I talk about the meeting of the human spirit and the divine spirit. The incarnation, however, is not a single instant in time, but it encompasses all that Christ accomplished for us, including especially his death on the cross, the most poignant moment of mediation. In the flesh, Christ was born, lived, suffered, and died. Momentarily naked, like every human being after death, he descended to the realms of the dead to rob the enemy of his prey and to raise them with himself as he assumed his risen body. And there's more. We anticipate not bare rescue from sin and from death, as foreshadowed on Easter morning, when those who had been dead were seen walking the streets of Jerusalem. Look at Matthew 20, uh, 27 there. Um, it, and, and that was a hope for the general re resurrection. But rather, the resurrection is followed by the ascension, which is indicative of our human journey and not simply of Jesus' unique divine nature. We know this because when he ascended, he did so by taking the glorified human nature, the glorified human body indeed, with him as a prize to present before the Father. The incarnation is not undone by the ascension, but established forever in glory by our perfect representative, the new and true human being. It's not as though our gospel were a cosmic Star Trek episode where Captain is beamed up and down by Scotty, staging a visit on the planet and then a return as though nothing had happened. No, the whole of our humanity is put on by God the Son, never to be shed. And it is in this conjunction that the mediation takes place. The ascension brings the whole matter to perfection. So, St. John Chrysostom speaks eloquently about this in his sermon on the ascension of our Lord, which has the power to lead us today to great joy, not just in the future. I wish I had time to read the whole thing, but here is just a snippet of this, of it to give you a taste. And what did this mediator, Jesus, do? The work of a mediator. For it is if two had been turned away from each other, and since they were not willing to talk together, Another one comes and placing himself in the middle, loosened the hostility of each of the two. And this is also what Christ did. God was angry with us for we were turning away from God, our human loving master. Christ, by putting himself in the middle, exchanged and reconciled each nature to the other. And how did he put himself in the middle? He himself took on the punishment that was due to us from the Father and endured both the punishment from there and the reproaches from here. And what is this? Is the one who himself was abused the very same one who encourages? Yes, indeed, for he's God. <clears throat> and because of this, our God, our human loving Father, entreats us. And look what happened. The son of the one who is making the appeal is the mediator. And he has brought us up to the heights with him. Jesus then is both the mediator and the mediation. 
And what he negotiates is not simply a peace treaty, but a new and true alliance by which we become, dare we say it, friends of God. Only he is capable of such a thorough and deep mediation, the likes of which we could never have imagined. The effects of sin and death are strong, but God's strength made perfect in the weakness of the true human is stronger beyond all reckoning. There is one mediator between God and man who is both God and man. The ongoing mediation. The book of Hebrews helps us to understand his work more deeply. In the conclusion to the book, the author calls his work a periclesis, a word of encouragement, such as a congregation receives in a sermon. We can thus expect to be encouraged or strengthened as we delve into what this sermon has to say about our mediator. Especially in Hebrews, we learn that though the saving work of Christ is accomplished in one sense, it is also ongoing. Once a mediator, always a mediator. Jesus' continued action is made possible because of the promised union of heaven and earth. The opening verses of Hebrews fasten specifically upon his work of mediation. In this, the age of the new covenant, God has spoken through his son, because this is the one through whom he created the world, chapter 1, verse 2. This speaking through the son amounts to what we could call a mediation of divine knowledge. As Clement of Alexandria put it, Jesus is the heavenly teacher of everyone who was created, bringing us to perfection through his teaching. So it is right that we should call no one our teacher on earth. It's perhaps easy for us to gloss over the wonder of this because we have heard the gospel so often. But St. Anthony was perceptive when he admonished them, his monks in his day, not to be astonished because an emperor had written to them, but rather because God both wrote the Torah for our sake and has far more amazingly spoken through his own son. This mediation of knowledge then is no light manner. Besides the mediation of knowledge, the son alone has made purification for sins, Hebrews 1.3, thus affecting a mediation of forgiveness, redemption, and sanctification. This short phrase in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 concerning the mediation of forgiveness sets the theme for what we will hear later in the book about his perfect offering, about the effectiveness of his blood for all time as an eternal covenant once offered for forgiveness and for sanctification. From Hebrews, we learn that the elaborate system of sacrifice in the Old Testament was intended as a preparation of the people to teach them their need of redemption and as a foreshadowing of that which was to come. The one mediation that was the actual grounds of their forgiveness and that would be eternally available because it was enacted by the one who is both human and divine. Besides his mediation of knowledge and redemption, the book of Hebrews hints at an even fuller divine work of mediation. Our mediator has been seated in the glory is glorified flesh at the right hand of God. Hebrews 1 verse 4, thus joining humanity with God. Here we can be astonished at his mediation of glory and full communion. As Hebrews will exclaim, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation. Indeed, this mediation of the God-man means that we have been brought to the verge of a whole new reality, if we have the eyes to see it. Before our imaginations, the climax of Hebrews puts forth a scenario in which we find ourselves in a place far more inspiring than that of the Hebrews before Sinai when the law was given. We who are in Christ find ourselves at the true Mount Zion, ranged with angels dressed in festal garments, together with all the faithful and together with God. Hebrews chapter 10. This communion has been made possible by Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, whose blood reconciles us with God and with each other. Indeed, if we look at the big picture, we see that Jesus' mediation is the basis for the reconciliation of all things in heaven and in earth. 
and the foundation of our communion with God, the Holy Trinity. Mediated knowledge of God is accompanied by mediated forgiveness and cleansing and ends in mediated communion and glory. Jesus, our brother, is not ashamed to share our humanity. And so we come by his mediation to share in his divine glory. The very nature of our mediator, who is both human and divine, shows us that we receive not just forgiveness through him, but also a heavenly calling. Grasping the huge scope of Jesus' work for us helps us not to freeze the heavenly work of mediation in time or fasten it only to the cross, astonishing though that moment of Holy Friday was. Mediation is bound up with the incarnation, with the healing and teaching work of Jesus, and with the resurrection and ascension, as well as the crucifixion. His mediating work seen dramatically on the cross is ongoing as he intercedes at the right hand of the Father for us, Romans chapter 8. We anticipate not a static future, but one in which we grow ever closer and closer to God and more in harmony with the rest of his creatures. As the theologian Staniluo puts it, the souls that are at the individual judgment are found capable of communion with God. Sorry, the souls that at the individual judgment are found capable of, a, capable of communion with God are not fixed in a state of immobile and in individual contemplation, but in a communion of love with the Holy Trinity and among themselves. Together they praise God's glory, and together they serve before the divine throne. Together they drink even more deeply of his love, of a fountain never running dry. The God-man who is our mediator. The fourth gospel has been, of course, the traditional place where Christians have gone to revel in the divinity of our Lord. From the first verse, we learn that Jesus, the word, is God, though there is even more to the mystery of God than this divine and human person. The gospel will go on to unfold the wonders of the Father and the Holy Spirit in due course. The first chapter concentrates upon the Son in relation to the Father. Here, we hear about how the word is with or towards God, prostantheon, and he was God. And at the end of the intro, in verse 18, we are told that no one has seen God except for this word, who is also the light and the only begotten God himself, for he is in the bosom of the Father, and has told us who the Father is, or exegeted in the Greek, the Father to us. Think about the name, the Word. Surely this hints to us that it is by this one that any knowledge, logos, of the Father is possible. The Old Testament God is incognito, revealing only a very little about his nature. Through the New Covenant, this one becomes known to us as the Son shows forth the Father and then introduces us to the Holy Spirit as a person rather than simply an amorphous extension of a mysterious God. This revelation of the Father is a special emphasis then in John's Gospel, but it is also in harmony with the other Gospels where Jesus is recorded as saying, no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. In the fourth gospel, Jesus appears as the mediating God. This presentation of Jesus as divine mediator is confirmed by the I am sayings of the gospel. I am the living bread, the light of the world, the one who bears witness, the door of the sheep, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth, the life, the true vine. My father's a fine dresser. I'm the vine, you're the branches. And then quite simply, but not so simple, before Abraham was, I am. As with the first verses of the gospel, each of these phrases, especially the final one, has been taken to underscore the divinity of Jesus. After all, life, light, shepherd, vine are symbols associated with the God of the Old Testament, and they evoke various passages from the Torah, the Psalms, and the prophets for the knowing reader. And the name given to Moses for the Lord was, of course, the I am, the YHWH, the ha on, the existing one in Greek. 
Jesus then claims continuity with this enlightening, feeding, guiding, husbanding, and shepherding God who is being in himself. He's divine, yes. He's also the mediator, the one who makes a way for us, who is himself the way. Not only the one who enlightens everyone coming to the world, he's the light. He himself will shepherd his people. He will set up a shepherd too, a new David, a new Messiah for them. He's the way to our resurrection. He's the very vine of God in whom we find our place. He is the great I am, whose delight it was to speak to Moses, to guide the people, and to promise more to come. The very title by which he's known, the word, implies this office of mediation, doesn't it? A word carries a thought, an idea, the authority of the one who is speaking. As Jesus says in his poignant words to Philip, have I been with you so long and you do not know me? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. And as Gregory of Nazianzen explains, the Son is thus a precise and clear declaration of the nature of of the Father. Yes, there's nothing that can exist that is not dependent upon this, our mediator. The wonder of such dependence is that it leads to maturity rather than just leaving us in a state of spiritual infancy. For the light that shines upon us will come to be in us. The water that he gives to a person, as he promised the Samaritan woman, will become in that same one a spring of water springing up to eternal life. His desire is not that we should be only servants, but be his friends. For he explained that all I have heard from my father, I have made known unto you. Thus, we go from the elementary but staggering lesson of John 1 to the inconceivable hope of glory that Jesus articulates in his high priestly prayer the night before his crucifixion. Note that his words to the Father are uttered on behalf not only of the apostles, but of all those, all of us who would believe through his witness. I do not pray for these only, he says, John 17, verse 20, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The glory that you've given to me, I've given to them that they may be one even as we are one, I and them, and you and me, that they may become perfectly one. Father, I desire that they also whom you've given to me may be with me where I am, to behold my glory, which you have given me in your love for me before the foundation of the world. The glory, the unity, the love of the triune God mysteriously shared between the divine persons before the foundation of the world is by the prayer of Jesus to become ours. Jesus' prayer is realized when the gift of the Holy Spirit, that other divine counselor, comes among God's children, making them one body, enlivening them so that they can do God's work, reminding them of what they have seen and heard, enlightening them to read all the scriptures in the light of Jesus, God's final word, and conforming the spirit of each believer to the will of God's spirit. We receive all this as a gift, not as a right or as a natural and inborn characteristic, for we are creatures, not the creator. That same God who said, I will not give my glory to another, now draws us into his fellowship and shares his glory with those of us who are in the Son. As St. Paul reminded the Corinthians, what do you have that you did not receive? Um, Christ's very nature is to be the mediating God through whom we receive many treasures. Yet the greatest gift that he mediates is not an external grace, but his very self, which we receive as light, water, life, bread, wisdom, sanctification, redemption, and glory. And so we see the generosity of God in the water and blood that flowed from Jesus on the cross in the giving over of his spirit for the sake of humankind. He has done all this so that he can truly speak to us, as he did to St. Mary Magdalene, about my father and your father. With Thomas, we cry out, my Lord and my God. There is 
one God the Father, and one mediator, and one spirit, whose personal work on our behalf will never end. And one plus one plus one makes one. Thank you. I was busy scribbling down notes here so I could remember everything that <laughs> you said. But... Buy the book next year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for a stimulating lecture. Wow. Yes. Um, we, ha we, ha I won't, I feel like I could just ha sit and have a conversation with you now, but that would be selfish. So I, uh, we have some time for discussion. I, um, I neglected to introduce my colleague at the beginning, John Bupalan, who is my co-host for the evening. Sorry, John. And he is going to be monitoring the chat. And so, um, uh, and he's writing in it now so that I don't have to look at the chat. Um, you, can, uh, you can also use the raised hand function in, um, uh, in, the, in Zoom. Don't just just don't forget to put your hand down after you've been acknowledged. Um, or you can, if I can get this on gallery, I'll get this on gallery view, and you can also wave, or you can just uh, unmute yourself and speak up. So there's a variety of ways to do this. I'm I'm kind of new to this hosting a uh, lecture on Zoom, so we're just gonna we're gonna try this. Uh, but we do want to have some engagement with Dr. Humphrey, and I'm sure that there are lots of things with that that you would be interested in picking up on. So if if you have a question, uh, I'm looking at, at Chatty. If you have a if you have a question, uh, please introduce yourself, maybe, and um, if you're on Zoom, and uh, say who you are. Keep your question short, fairly, and to the point. That is, uh, don't give your own mini lecture. We'd like to have as much time for questions as possible. And I'd love so, to see your faces if you want to start your video. That'd be really nice. Yes, that's I feel a great like I'm not idea. talking into the void, you know? Yeah, right now everybody's got just their names up, but it would be True. it would be lovely if you're not in your pajamas or anything, or even if you are, to uh, to to show your face so that we can interact with real people. Um, so I've got it on gallery view now, and I am, there we go. So who would like to start us off with a question? Sheila, may I ask a question? Of course. <laughs> uh, Dr. Humphrey, thank you so much for your uh, lecture. Uh, like my colleague, I've been scribbling notes here as well. <laughs> so I'm going to quickly look at my notes here and ask you a question. I really appreciated how you parsed out the present continuous mode of mediation. Uh, uh, and and if, I, if there was a takeaway for me, that's my takeaway for tonight, that mediation uh, that Jesus as mediator, that mediation is a present continuous activity. So my question is this, what implications does that have uh, for us, right? I mean, I mean, I mean th this is an ongoing series, so you'll have more to say, obviously. Uh, but you, you were referring to Jesus's death, right? And I have heard some people talk about Jesus's death as a this once and for all. But mm -hmm. what I heard in your remarks is maybe that is present continuous as well, just like how mediation is. Could you just unpack that a little bit for me? I was really struck by that. So I think there are a couple of mistakes that can be made in this. Um, one is to isolate the moment on the cross or moments that, that Jesus dying. Um, so that it isn't connected with anything that went before and anything that went after. And that's blocked off for us because we see clearly that Jesus' death on the cross had an effect on those who came before. 
because we have in Matthew's gospel, those righteous dead walking around in the streets of Jerusalem, and we have the promise of the general resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. So we know, and and we so we know that it had an effect on those who came before, and the transfiguration itself, which I'll talk about tomorrow, shows Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. So it it can't be isolated. On the other hand, I do think that, and I've actually been working on this for another lecture that I'm giving in a couple of weeks. I think that we do have um, a, a a temptation to want to spiritualize things so much that the historical the historical thatness of the crucifixion is forgotten uh-huh. um and that um uh, we we uh in in so doing dishonor that act as something that was um uh, that, that accomplished god's purposes i think we could perhaps um, have the best of both worlds and, and, and avoid those traps by talking about God's mediation and Jesus' mediation being time full and talk about what happened in the cross as affecting the whole of human history, past, present, and future. Um, so that, yes, it's a unique event, but it's the kind of thing that if you drop a pebble in the water you know, the the ripples go out all around. And so, yes, it's a once for all, but it continues to have an effect. Um, I would say beyond that, that um, the the mediation that we see Jesus doing um, when he goes beyond the veil in the heavenlies need not simply be confined to redemption. Redemption is really important, right? Our, Our being... Um, put in a right relationship with God, or having sin removed from us, that's really important. But that's not all that is promised to us, as Paul says in Romans. And not only that, but we hope in the glory of God. So I think that the mediating Jesus is there praying for us, along with, and we'll talk about this tomorrow, the whole body praying in his will, that we come into our own as the sons and daughters of God, that in fact, we become all that we're meant to be. And that in doing so, we bring this creation with us because we are, we are kind of the link between the, 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 the heavenly world and, um, and the created um, earthly world. Um, and so that, that mediation, I think, is bigger than redemption, though certainly it includes the, uh, the ongoing effects of redemption in the world today. Thanks. I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to barge in here. So, um, so uh, a couple of times, and I, so I'm, I hear this. I'm working on a commentary on the letter of James that talks mm-hmm. about Abraham as friend of God. And so I, I noticed when you, um, which is it, which is quite rare, um, and and I noticed when you talked about Jesus as mediator, making us friends and. And Jesus does in John say, I call you friends. But mm-hmm. I'd love to hear you say a little bit more about how mediation works to make us friends of God and what that what that means. So there's all kinds of loves that we can talk about. And the Bible doesn't just use the friend metaphor. It used the metaphor between husband and wife and so on as well, right? But typically, I, I take the cue of C.S. Lewis. I think he's quite right. And he's, he's following the classical um, uh, philosophers here that friendship um, is characterized by two people, not who gaze at each other enamored in love. That would be a husband and wife, right? Although we can do that with God too. But two people who stand by side by side, holding hands, delighted in some, or even more than two, could be three or four, delighting in something that they both share. And so Jesus says, I no longer call you servants, but friends, because a servant does not know what his master is doing. We have been led into the secret, the mystery of God, what God is doing in the world, and not only head knowledge, but we're being, we're being incorporated into that action. Um, Paul in 2 Corinthians 6 speaks about the apostles, but I think it could be more general as being co-workers with God. And so we share God's 
dare I be, I, I don't mean to be um, sacrilegious, but let me be a bit anthropomorphic. We, we share God's passion for all the things that he's doing, the good passion, right? We share God's interests. We share God's activities. We're even, um, in, in my own tradition, we speak about the availability of God's energies to draw us into the actions of God. And God's energies are seen as actually part of God himself, not as separate actions. So huh. the kind of glory that Jesus has in the transfiguration when the father says, listen to him, he shares with, with the disciples who are caught up in the glory cloud and themselves apparently start to shine. That's beautiful. I, I hadn't thought about the C.S. Lewis connection with the four loves and the friends looking outward, but I like that connection. Um, someone else, and I either feel free to ask a question in chat or just just speak up. Unmute yourself and speak up. Dr. Humphreys? Go ahead, Bill. No. Okay. So oh, I can see you. It's wonderful. Hello. Uh, introduce uh, yourself briefly. Oh, gee whiz. I don't know. I'm a, I'm a longtime clergy man, retired. Uh, used to work uh, in the same building as Sheila for a while. Anyway, uh, my quick question is, uh, you know, I'm great into metaphor, but I... I hear you saying we're not talking, you're not talking metaphor with mediation. Is that right? Um, I, I guess I don't quite understand how mediation could be a metaphor in that it's an action. Um, I'm thinking of any means in which somebody stands between two other people or somebody stands to 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 bring um to bring two parties together or maybe one party with a whole bunch of others together right so um in the sense that uh maybe i'm using a metaphor if i talk about the bible is mediating right oh. but it does help to bring us to god so that that might be more metaphorical but, but it, it, it is an actual instance of it, I think. Well, you were kind of using metaphor when you mentioned uh, a group of friends or husband and wife. Uh, that's the kind of, you were drawing a picture for us. Mm -hmm. uh, in that sense, I guess it's a metaphor. But mediation itself is something vibrant and real. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and we could describe that action in by means of other things, I think. I think I think mediation is only one way of describing it. I mean, if we're thinking about Jesus' redemption, and that's a mediating act, it's been pictured as, you know, our being bought back, our being released from slavery, our being uh, reconciled like a friend with God, um, all kinds of different ways of thinking about, you know, uh, about how God, how Jesus accomplished that. Okay, thank you. Can I ask another one? Uh, I guess go, somebody else had a question. Go ahead. <laughs> I had a, I'm wondering what, where does forgiveness enter in into this image of uh, mediation? I mean, uh, Jesus, um, from the beginning, uh, one of the first miracles he did, he said, the first thing he said was, your, your sins are forgiven. Yes. What is, what is, how does forgiveness and mediation mesh? So, St. Paul would say that we have two enemies, and I guess he's speaking a little metaphorically there, but we have sin and we have death. And so... As we've been speaking about Jesus as the great mediator, his um, incarnation, his work on earth, his um, crucifixion, his resurrection, 
and his ascension have something to do with both sin and death. Insofar as they have to do with sin, they are what he does, all the actions um, are an offer of forgiveness. Now, of course, it's, it's not magic, right? It's an offer of forgiveness. It's a kind of a transaction. We have to receive it. And that, that fits in a little bit with, with um, what the fathers were at pains to talk about when they were trying to explain to us about First um, uh, Timothy chapter 2, why, why it's important to stress Jesus as the mediator after, after St. Paul has talked about how we should pray for all leaders, for all those who have an authority, for everyone, because it's God's will that none should be lost. And then he goes on, um, Paul goes on, or whoever wrote First Timothy goes on to talk about the importance of the one mediator, Jesus, because of the foundation, the way that we know that our prayers are in line with God is uh, uh, with God's will, is that we recognize what Jesus has in fact done, and part of that is the offer of forgiveness. It's also a turning around of our deadly condition of the fact that we will die. It's it's uh, it's putting things in place so that a re general resurrection can can occur. So so there are you know forgiveness is on the sin side. And the hope of glory, the hope of a full life is on the side of the other enemy, that is death. And what Jesus has done um, accomplishes both ends. And so our prayers also, you know, in the, in, in the church and our actions have to be concerned for the person's um, response to God, telling them that forgiveness has been um, offered and um, explaining to them the importance of receiving that, but also for their bodies, because God cares clearly for their bodies or there wouldn't have been the resurrection and there wouldn't have been Jesus' miracles. Thank you. We maybe have time for one more. Just looking at my screens here, make sure I don't miss anyone. Well, I said I had one more, so I'm gonna barge in here. Um, and, and I actually think I know what you would say, but I'm gonna, so you, you used up paraclesis with Hebrews and mm -hmm. you work with John a little bit, but I'm wondering where the paraclete fits in all of this. It's, um, so John 16 says this, the, the paraclete will, will, uh, will teach you uh, when I'm away and so on. And, mm -hmm. and you, I love what you said at the end that there's, there's one God and one mediator and one spirit and there's equals one. One plus one equals one. Um, but you said a little bit more about um, the spirit as mediator, because in John, I think like at the end of John's gospel, there's such an emphasis on the paraclete as the mediator. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Romans 8, the last uh, half of Romans 8 has a wonderful picture where the Holy Spirit seems to be pictured as a kind of a midwife. Yes. So you have this suffering world that is exposed to um, all, the, all the frustration of the fall. And within that, you've got humanity who dies too. And within that, you've got the church praying. And when the church doesn't know how to pray, the Holy and, and the groaning is going on, uh, hoping that things will come to birth. The Holy Spirit helps as a midwife would help a woman who's, who's yeah, living there. Yeah. So we have two pictures in Romans. Let's move to Romans because it's helpful there. Um, but we could find this also, I think, in, in John's gospel. Um, a kind of an incursion by God from the outside as God takes on human flesh, right? God the Son takes on human flesh, becomes one of us. And then something from the inside as the Holy Spirit inhabits the church and helps us to become all that we are to be. And so it's a kind of a two-prong attack. Can I use military <laughs> language? Nice, I'm sorry. Of God against sin and against death to help not just humanity, but the whole of the created order that's fallen because of us. 
So uh, another way I would put this is to go to Luke Acts and to say that it's clear that, and we get this also in some of the Pauline letters like Ephesians, that Jesus' ascension, the flip side of that is Pentecost. Jesus Hmm. takes our human nature and even our body up to God and exalts it so that as a complement to that, the Holy Spirit then can indwell the church um, deeply and not just in a spotty way, such as in the Old Testament. So you need the glorification of the God-man in the ascension in order to bring about the effect of the Holy Spirit indwelling us now, both singly and as a body. So I didn't get an opportunity to say a lot about the Holy Spirit because, I mean, in we uh, there are certainly that, that now you now I've got another chapter. I've got to do some <laughs> mediation. Of this. Thank you very much. <laughs> but but I, I mean, we do tend when we talk about the mediator to think about Jesus. Yeah, you know, it's, he's called after all the, the, the one mediator between God and man. But the mediation of Jesus before the throne of God in heaven continues because of the. Or, or is made effective, might we say, I'm thinking on, on my feet here, is made effective in us as the Holy Spirit warms us to the mediation that Jesus is giving. So they work in concert, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our time is up. I think we're going to wrap it up for this evening. You are all welcome to return tomorrow at 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Thank you, Dr. Humphrey, for a stimulating first evening. We look forward to hearing you tomorrow morning on mediation inside and outside the household of God. And I hope uh, you all come back again and see you tomorrow. Thanks you. Thank you again. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody.